Hey guys, today we are going to talk a little bit about Gregor Mendel. So Gregor Mendel lived in the early 1800s and he is considered to be the father of genetics. Um, and so um, Gregor Mendel was a monk and he maintained the garden in the monastery or in the, in the place where he lived. And when he was doing that, um, he studied pea plants there. And he noticed that different pea plants had a lot of different traits. And um, he would write down the pea plants. And he got to where he would cross different pea plants and see um, what the outcome was, what the offspring looked like. And so what he realized were that um, these peas have these different um traits that they have. And um, he formulated what is known as the particulate hypothesis that said these traits come from their parents. They pass on these genes, okay, um, which is in the DNA, and those genes um, come together to produce a different identity in their offspring. And so Mendel is considered the father of genetics because he was really the first one to um, kind of study this and tell us uh, what we know today about genetics. So this would be like an early experiment that Mendel did. And we look at it now and we may think, well, that's really simple. I could have done that, you know, and he gets a lot of credit for that. But at the time, you know, nobody really knew this stuff. And it was pretty groundbreaking, honestly. So Mendel, um, he called the P, the P generation, the P stands for parent. So these are the, you know, the parents that he crossed. And he said these were true breeding parents. And so what that means is if you bred those purple flowers together with one another, they would always make a purple flower. They were true breeding. Every time they bred with one just like it, they would make that same color. Same went for the white flowers. If you bred with a white flower with another white flower, then every single time they would make um, a white flower. And so he, he took these that he called true breeding and he crossed them together. And so all of the next generation, which is known as the F1, these terms P, F1, F2, those are very common in genetics. So you need to, you know, kind of you be able to use those terms. And so he said these purple flower, um, that, you know, everything was purple flowers. They had all made purple flowers, okay? And then when he took those purple flowers and he crossed them together in the third generation or the F2 generation, he had about 705 purple flowered plants and 224 white flowered plants. So, you know, that's close to like a, you see three here and one here. So, you know, a 75% of the purple ones, 25% of the white ones. And so he kind of got to figuring and saying like, how could this happen? Okay. And so Mendel decided that these flowers, um, um, you know, these, these purple flowers in the middle must be hybrids, that they carry these traits from the white parent, and you're able to pass that on in the next generation. So I'm going to do a few simple Punnett squares for these, just to kind of get us started in thinking about them. So I'm going to use the letter F for flowers. So the purple is what we call dominant, okay? Because that's what you see in the next generation. You see that purple flower. The white is what we call recessive. You don't see that in the F1 generation. Okay? So if we do a simple Punnett square, and hopefully you all can do these. Some letters are better to pick than others because they're easier to tell. So make sure you pick letters like that are that are pretty easy to tell, like I don't usually like to do S's because it's hard to tell a capital S from a lowercase s or certain letters that, you know, look really similar. The F's look a little bit different, so they're, that's kind of why I picked F here. Um, okay, so if we cross, except I wrote one of them, except I wrote that wrong, so just, you know, let me just scribble that out. I can't erase very well on this iPad. Okay, big F, big F for, for purple daddy and little... Or little um, F, little F for white mama, okay? And we don't know if it's really mama or daddy. I just made that up, okay? And so when we fill in this Punnett square, 
We get big F, little f in all of them. We carry it over and bring it down. Okay? And so all of these we would say are big F, little f. And that shows the dominant trait. So to be dominant, you could be big F, big F, or big F, little f. Okay? And it appears that to be recessive, you had to have that little f, little f. So in the next generation, if we take these big F, little f's that we got and cross them, then you'll get big F, big F, big F, little f, big F, little f, and little f, little f. And so there we see that 25, 75, or, you know, 3 um, to 1 ratio that Mendel observed in that F2 generation. Um, and so these are simple Punnett squares. They're called um, uh, one-factor crosses um, that show a single trait, okay? The trait being shown here is the color of the flower, all right? So, um, Mendel said, you know, after he did these experiments and did these models, he said alternative versions of genes account for the variations in inherited characters. These alternative versions of a gene are called alleles. And so we are representing our alleles as the big F, little f, okay? Two alleles code for a gene, one from mom and one from dad, okay? You can get your little big F from your mom and your little F from your dad. Or maybe you get a big F from both parents or a little F from both parents. But two alleles code for a gene, okay? Alleles exist on the chromosome, okay? And remember how you have two copies of each chromosome? Right? So if the gene for flower color, let's say, is, is right here, then maybe this one's got a big F and maybe this one's got a little f. And that's what that is. Alleles are different versions of a gene. And that's a really important concept. Okay? And so the law of segregation tells us that these alleles separate during gamete formation. So we saw yesterday in meiosis that chromosomes separate um, when, when sperm and egg or, you know, when these gametes are formed. And so you don't inherit them together. You don't get FF from mom. You get one from mom and one from dad because of the law of segregation, how those alleles separate and end up in different gametes. Okay? So if your dad carries FF, you know, one of them which he got from his mother, one of them which he got from his father, um, you know, there's a 50% chance that you would get either one of those alleles. And those gametes separate independently in meiosis. All right? And this is that picture just like I showed you in our, and that I kind of drew for you in an uglier way. In our homologous pair of chromosomes, you know, this is a locus, Right? the place where that gene is, and we have an allele for purple flowers, which would be an F, a big F, and allele for white flowers, which would be a little f. And those two combine to determine what color the flower will be. In this case, big F, little f would show the dominant trait because it's got that big F, which is purple. To be able to show the recessive trait, you have to have two of the recessive alleles. The dominant is going to dominate, okay? So if you've got a big F, you're going to show the big F purple. If you've got a little left, in order to show the white, you have to have two little Fs, all right? So um, Mendel used some um, terminology here. So the first is geno. Whoa. The first is genotype. So the genotype is the genetic makeup. The genotype could be big F, big F. It could be big F, little F. 
Or it could be little f, little f. And that's exactly how you say it. That when I ask you to give me the genotype, I want you to write some letters. Okay? Phenotype is the appearance. And so that would be purple or white. Think phenotype is the physical manifestation, what you see with your eyes. Okay? Genotype is what the genetics, what the genes say. We can't see that with our eyes, okay? Although sometimes you can deduce that. For example, by looking at the flower color, you can deduce that it's big F, big F, or big F, little f, okay? A monohybrid cross or a single factor cross is what I called it a moment ago, is one character. And then a dihybrid cross is two characters, or sometimes this is called a two factor cross, Okay, and so that would be like a dihybrid cross. We're going to look at some of those in just a minute. But that would be like looking to see if a plant could be purple and tall. Okay, Mendel studied lots of different characteristics. He could studied um, the shape of this, the pod, the height, the color of the flower, um, um, whether... I can't remember all of them right now. I think there's about seven characteristics um, that he studied, though. And so dihybrid crosses or two-factor crosses would be looking at the likelihood of two of those factors being inherited together. And we'll see some of those in just a moment. Okay. Whoops. I wrote on my slide. Sorry. The law of independent assortment. Um... Um, tells us that each allele segregates independently during gamete formation. And so that's what we talked about um, yesterday, the law of independent assortment, because they um, line up on the metaphase plate at a, in a random order. It doesn't matter, you know, they're passed on randomly, okay? And again, that's one of the reasons that we have genetic variation. Okay, so let's look at this one factor cross together. All right, and you all are going to have several of these to practice for homework. One factor crosses are usually pretty easy for students. It's those two factor crosses that get them stumped. Okay, so let's look at this one. A brown dog is homozygous. Now, I haven't touched this word yet. Homozygous. The prefix homo means same. Okay, and so homozygous means that it has two of the same alleles. So homozygous would be big F, big F, or little f, little f. Okay, heterozygous would mean that it has, it's a hybrid. Sometimes we also call that a hybrid. It means it has a dominant allele and a recessive allele, okay? So, let's keep reading. A, home, a brown dog is homozygous for the gene that controls coat color. The brown dog is mated with an albino or an all-white dog. The dogs have many puppies. All of the puppies have a brown coat color, Okay, so what you should be able to deduce by reading this is that since all of the puppies have a brown coat color, that that means that brown is dominant. Okay, so this daddy dog, I'm going to put him as big B, big B. All right, he, because we know he is homozygous and brown is dominant. So big B is going to be is going to be brown. All right, so, and then um, he was mated with an albino all-white dog. So, because that shows the recessive color, that is going to have to be little b, little b, okay? So, when we do a Punnett square for them, it says draw a Punnett square for this cross. We're going to have... Um, brown dog daddy and white dog mama and we complete our Punnett square it says give the expected genotypic and phenotypic outcomes so our genotypic outcome is 100 percent 
big B, little b. Okay. And then our phenotypic outcome is 100% brown. All of them are going to show the recessive trait, or I'm sorry, the dominant trait because they have that big B. All right. Now, it says here, what are the dominant and the recessive alleles? So the dominant equals brown equals big B. The recessive equals white equals little b. That is the dominant and the recessive alleles. Now, the third question says, what would be the results if these offspring, so they're talking about these offspring here, mated with an albino dog? So that's the first part, an albino dog. So if the offspring, big B, little b, mated with an albino dog. We said earlier that an albino is showing the recessive trait, so it's going to be little b, little b. So that would be big B, little b, little b, little b, big B, little b, little b, little b. So for number one, it would be 50% um, brown and 50% white. Now this specific question says, what would the results be? So I don't really care on that one if you give the genotype or phenotype, because it doesn't ask specifically, okay? Let's look at the second one. If you crossed those offspring with a homozygous brown dog. So again, those offspring were big B, little b. And if you crossed it with a homozygous brown dog, that's going to be big B, big B. Remember, homozygous means two of the same alleles, and brown is big B. So when I fill in my Punnett square, you should see that you get 100% brown. Or if you wanted to be a little more specific, you could say 50% big B, little b, 50% big B, big B. Okay? And then the last one, it says a heterozygote. So if we're crossing our offspring, those offspring again, they were big B, little b, with a heterozygote. Fill in our Punnett square. You should get 75% brown. 25% white. All of those whites are going to be little b, little b. The browns would be, um, some of them would be big b, big b, and some of them would be big b, little b. Okay. And that's how you do a one factor um, cross. Okay. So that should have been pretty easy. Let's go on and look at a two-factor cross. So this says about 70% of Americans perceive a bitter taste from the chemical phenolthiocarbamine, or PTC. So I told you off, we were in class, I would have you taste this, but unfortunately we're not there to do that. Um, I hope that once we ever get to go back to school, hopefully, maybe um, sometime, then we will get to make up for lost time with labs. So, the ability of, to taste this chemical results from a dominant allele, big T, and not being able to taste this chemical results from having two recessive alleles, little t, okay? So, a big T is a taster, little t is a non-taster, all right? Albinism is also a single locus trait with normal pigment being dominant, all right, so big A is normal. And then little a, um, the lack of pigment being recessive. All right, so albino. All right. Um, a normally pigmented woman 
who is heterozygous for PTC tasting. All right. So our woman is heterozygous for PTC tasting. And we know she's normal. So she has to have at least one big A. All right. We don't know if she's big A, big A. We don't know if she's big A, little A yet. Okay. So it, she says, um, has a father who is homozygous for albinism and PTC tasting. So her dad is albino. He's homozygous for albinism. That means dad is little a, little a. Okay? So he has to pass her on his little a. So she must have got big A here from her mom, but then she got little a from her dad. So that information is what we need to be able to come up with her genotype. That's why it's given there. And then it also says he's homozygous for PTC tasting. So she must have gotten her big T from her dad as well. Okay. She marries a heterozygous, normally pigmented man. So he is normal pigmented heterozygous. This is our man. Who is a taster. So he has to have one big T. But who has a mother that does not taste PTC. So the mom, if she is a non-taster, has to be little t, little t. Which means she had to give her son at least one little t. But we know he can taste, so he had to have a big T. Alright? Give the phenotypic and genotypic ratios of the offspring. All right. Now I'm going to go to another page um, to write, to work this problem because I'm going to run out of room here, but I want us to remember this so I don't screw it up. Both of them are big A, little A, big T, little T. Okay. Big A, little A, big T, little T. Times big A, little A, big T, little T. Both of them are that. So what we have to do to be able to make a Punnett square for this, this Punnett square is going to have 16 boxes. It's a four by four. All our last ones were two by twos. Okay. So draw you a big Punnett square. All right. We have to use the FOIL method. Like in math. This is where people go wrong. Don't forget the FOIL method. Okay? So when you do FOIL, you do... Oh, crap. You do big A. Oh. Mm, I, clearly, it's been a bit since I've done this. I've screwed that up. Okay. When we do FOIL... Don't listen to what I just said. When we do FOIL, we have to FOIL each one separately. So I'm going to go big A times big T, big A times little t, little A times big T, and little A times little t. And that's how I foil that. Those are all of my possible allele combinations, okay? Now, we're, we could do the same thing over here. Big A times big T, big A times little t, little A times big T, and little A times little t. Or I could just realize those two are the same, and it's going to work out the same way and write the same things here. All right. Now, I have to fill in my boxes, okay? So... You always want to write the same alleles beside each other. So I want to put my A's together and I want to put my T's together. So this is going to be big A, big A, big T, big T. Big A, big A, big T, little T. Big A, little A, big T, big T. I'm going to keep filling in. You can fill in yours.
Okay, so I've got that all filled in. So the combinations that we can have here are taster and normal color. We can have taster and albino. We can have non-taster and normal. And we can have non-taster and albino. Okay? So, we have to go through and count those. Um, and our, remember, our total, we have 16 boxes. So, it should add up to 16. Okay? So, I'm going to kind of cross them off as I do. There's, I'm going to count the taster normals first. So, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay? So, there are nine normal tasters. Okay? Taster albino. So that means it's going to have to have two little A's and at least one big T, okay? So I'm going to mark these with a different kind of X. One, two, three, okay? The next one, non-taster normal, means it has to have... Um, um, no, uh, two little T's and at least one big A. So I'm going to circle these, okay? Two little T's and at least one big A. And so there were three. And then the last one, non-taster albino, is going to have to have um, two little A's and two little T's. And I think it's just this last one here. So there's one. Okay. So the ratio that we have here is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. That is how you say that ratio. Now, that is a very important number that I just, er that I just erased my box around. That is a very important ratio. Every single time you have... Two that are hybrids for both traits. Both parents are hybrids for both traits. Meaning both parents are big A, little A, big T, little T, or whatever letter you choose to use. It will end up in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. If you're taking an AP exam and you are crunched for time, it takes a lot of time to draw out that Punnett square and count those up. But if you can remember that you have two dihybrid parents and it's every time going to give you a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, then bam, you've, you've made that a lot easier, okay? The 9 is always both dominant traits. The taster and the normal were both the dominant traits, okay? The 3s are one dominant and one recessive trait. So taster was dominant, albino was recessive. Normal was dominant, non-taster was recessive. And then the one is both recessive traits. Non-taster and albinism were both the recessive traits. So you get that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. That's how that plays out every single time. Okay? All right. Let's look at one more of these dihybrid problems. Okay? It's not going to be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Um. So it says a blue-eyed, left-handed woman marries a brown-eyed, right-handed man who is heterozygous for both traits. So our man, let's use H for handedness and E for eyes, okay? So he is H, H, uh, sorry, big H, little H, big E, little E. He is heterozygous for both traits. It also says he is brown-eyed and right-handed. So that means that brown-eyed and right-handed are both dominant, okay? Because if he shows them and he's heterozygous, then that means that has to be the dominant. 
and it tells you down here, blue eyes and left-handed are recessive. So the woman, if she's blue eyes and left-handed, she has to be little h, little h, little e, little e, okay? Um, oh, I didn't give the genotypic ratios on this. I assume you know how to do that to be able to put the, um, the genotypic ratios there. Um, let's, let's keep going with this problem though. Okay. So we're going to make a Punnett square for this man and this woman. He's big H, little H, big E, little E. She's all little letters. All right. So let's go back to our notepad. So he's big H, little H, big E, little E. And she is little h, little h, little e, little e. And it doesn't matter if you transpose those letters and write the e's first. That doesn't matter at all. Okay? So what we're going to do first is we are going to foil. After I draw this big O square. So it's going to be big H, big E. Big H, little e. Little H, big E. Little H, little e. For that parent, okay? We could have just as easily put him down the side. It doesn't matter. Over here, it's going to be little H, little e. And that's all the letters that she has. So all of them are going to be little H, little e. Little h, little e, little h, little e, little h, little e. Okay? So when I fill out my Punnett square, I don't know why it does that. Okay? Now, I could keep going with these last few boxes. But they're all the same as this one. And all we need is a ratio. So it kind of seems like a waste to me. You might need to keep going. You, I mean, if you want to, great. But it just seems like a waste of time to me. So I would not recommend that. Not all Punnett squares you can do that for. This last one up here, we couldn't do that for. Because all the combinations of the letters were different. Sometimes... Uh, well, in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, hopefully you recognize the ratio when you don't have to work all that out, okay? Um, but in one like this, hopefully you recognize that you maybe don't have to do all of them. Sometimes you might have one where you would have to do two rows. Like, for example, if this was big H, little e, then you would need to fill out that second row, okay? But don't, do, don't make extra work for yourself if you don't have to because we're just looking for a ratio here. So looking at our offspring, this one is going to be right and, um, what was these? Brown eyes, okay? Right and brown eyes. This one's going to be right and blue eyes. This one's going to be left and brown eyes. And this one's going to be left and blue eyes, okay? And so... We would say that you would have a 25% chance, okay, and we have to give the genotypic and phenotypic ratio. So I'm just going to write just what I have in my Punnett square. I'm getting a little sloppy, sorry. Okay, and that is how I would solve that second problem. All right, so you all have several problems to do today. Um, I'm not making those due until um, Friday to give you a little bit of extra time to work on them. So if you have any questions, reach out to me. Don't forget to FOIL. That's the biggest mistake that people make in the dihybrid crosses. And let me know if you have any questions. If not, you'll have a great day.